street and uh, Robin. 104 years ago, the Kentish antiquarian Ralph Griffin read a paper on the health of the Canterbury Cloister to a Thursday evening meeting here at the Society of Antiquaries. And we've actually got the uh, attendance register on, on that if anyone should be interested to see uh, who actually um, came along. And six days earlier, the artillery on the Western Front had uh, temporarily fallen silent following the conclusion of the Second Battle of Artois, um, in which more than 100,000 men died. Um, Griffin had many interesting things to say, and when his talk was published in Archaeologia, uh, it carried a detailed appendix uh, which comprised the first in-depth scholarly analysis of the cloister shields. But Griffin was only laying the foundations there were important questions um, for which he could not provide unambiguous answers, such as, when did the building take place? Who was responsible for the overall design? And how was the cloister constructed? During the last two decades, some important new works have appeared on the history of the cathedral and its precincts, but relatively little could be said about the important national monument, which is the cloister. Was it the royal project? Uh, King Henry IV, of course, chose to be buried at Canterbury, and there is an abundance of royal heraldry in the cloister. Was it perhaps the work of a royal herald? Or was it a role of benefactors, as my friend Cecil Andrew Smith has always maintained, that you see in, um, in the picture on the screen? It was he who first introduced me to the cloister in February 1983. It cannot be a straightforward role called people arriving in Canterbury and giving money to the cathedral because with the solitary exception of the Bay of Christian Monarchs, um, there are no foreign arms here, despite the fact that the cathedral was still the major centre of pilgrimage at the time. Uh, why was it another 90 years before someone else came to pick up where Griffin left off? I will attempt to answer all of these questions during my talk. <clears throat> uh, we must um, begin um, with, by understanding a little bit of the basic geography of the cloister. And you'll be getting to see this slide again, so don't try and memorize all now. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about the South Walk, uh, but important to realise this lies against the cathedral nave, and that here we have the all-important uh, martyrdom uh, of Thomas Beckett um, in the transept and the chapter house um, on this side of the cloister. Um, in 1377, the nave was demolished, and it was while the nave was being rebuilt that Archbishop Sudbury that was brutally murdered in the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. The cathedral was struck only a year later by another calamity in the form of an earthquake which damaged both the cloister and the chapter house. In 1396, Archbishop Courtney left the princely sum of £200 in his will to rebuild the south walk of the cloister, and I wonder if perhaps this walk had been demolished in 1377. The south walk is very obviously different um, from the remainder of the cloister in that it contains little heraldry. It has rather beautiful um, figurative um, corridors, including many human faces. But one of these faces looks very much like a female version of Richard II, where unfortunately I don't have a picture, but I've long suspected that this is the face of Richard's mother, Princess Joan, the Fair Maid of Kent. The arms depicted are quite small and unobtrusive, as you can see, particularly the shield on the left here, which is of the priory. And they include those of Archbishop Courtney and his successor, Thomas Arundel. Uh, suddenly, um, in a biblical position um, outside
outside the doorways of the martyrs of Thomas Becket, you see carved large and prominently display the arms of the Archbishop's sister, Juliana <coughs> de Boone, Dowager Countess of Hereford, Essex and Northampton. Close by were once the royal arms of Portugal, who you see uh, restored um, in this picture. The only other arms in this position of privilege were those of the monastery itself. This conjunction of shields brings to mind the year 1405, when the Archbishop received his sister into the Cathedral Confraternity. In the same year, he married his nephew, the Earl of Arundel, to a daughter of the King of Portugal. And this uh, martyrdom bay, or bay one as it tends to be known, sits as a point of transition. Um, and here, slightly small, but hopefully you can, uh, can make it out. Um, we have a small number of these new larger shields in the next two bays to be constructed. Here in bay 36, um, we have the arms of fog, and in bay 35, importantly, we have the arms of Moheim, or moon. Sir Thomas Fogg and his wife, Joan de Loins, were great benefactors of the cathedral, who were together admitted to the Confraternity in 1404, when they made a donation towards the building of the chapter house. Joan Lady Moon made a very large request to the cathedral in her will on her death in 1404, and her arms were prominently displayed in the register book of the Confraternity, here quartered with the arms of her father, Virgo, should be double-tailed lion. <clears throat> in Bay 35, we must note the presence of a small shield here, uh, resembling those found in the south wall. So this is the last of the small shields. It's also noteworthy that the lines on the arms of Boone do not match the style of carving lazy used in the cloister. It looks as though a new expert in heraldic carving has been brought in. There's a new plan has emerged, and indeed all the subsequently erected bays are completely heraldic. It's been assumed that the south wall was constructed from east to west, as I now believe it was built from west to east. We urgently need a chronology to inform us how and why these decisions were reached. It has long been known from the fragmentary building accounts that the cloister was finished in 1414. Was the south wall completed and then the remaining cloister built later on? Well, that is still a tenable hypothesis, but the observations of the martyred men suggest rather that the cloister was built as part of a single continuous process. A crucial nugget of information um, is that the accounts record whereas two hundred pounds have been left to build the South Walk and its ten bays, the final cost was three hundred pounds. The difference in cost um, is explained by the decision to insert highly decorated vaulting rather than simply replacing what had been there previously. This gives us a unit cost per day of £30. Between 1411 and 1413, £540 was expended on the cloister, which equates to 18 bays at a rate of one every two months, which feels about right. In 1414, a final £95 was expended, equating to three bays, which fits in well with the heraldry as I will explain a little later. The building accounts are lost for the period 1406 to 1410. It's known that the work on the chapter house was finished in 1405 and that the total cost of the build was a thousand pounds. It seems reasonable to assume a steady rate of building of the cloister, which would place the commencement in July 1408. None of the heraldry is at variance with this chronology, but another curious finding has been that the direction of construction was changed not once, but twice. 
And understanding of why this happened helps to determine some of the rationale behind the whole project. The heraldry in front of the chapter house dates 1412, towards the end of the build, while at the other end of the south wall, the first fully heraldic bay, contains dating information suggesting the year 1410. So in my proposed chronology, the first bay, Bay 9, was built in July, August 1408, and through to Bay 35 in March, um, April 1410. Um, the the Martyrdom Bay 1 that was going up in November, December 1409, just at the time when Thomas Arundel resigned as Chancellor of England after three years as head of government. He is known to have returned to Canterbury and spent Christmas there. Quite likely his sister Juliana was with him. We will never know whether the arms selected for Bay 1 were a decision taken that Christmas or part of a predetermined plan. But he was able to observe the arms as they went up and to see how impressive they looked inside you. His many visitors would surely have been equally impressed. At this moment, the priory was in debt due to the cost of the cathedral rebuild. Archbishop Arundel knew about using heraldry to solicit donations towards building works. Um, his time as Archbishop of York coincided with the first usage of heraldic bosses in the vaulting of York Minster, and the first use of the same idea in the Canterbury Nave rightly follows his um, transfer to Canterbury in um, 1396. Very quickly, donations began to come in um, on the understanding that the donors' arms would be placed in the cloister. Now, the only possible reason for switching the direction of the building in 1410 would be that already the idea of a row of arms in stone had emerged, with something special being needed for the important bays outside the chapter house, for which more time was needed to prepare. Here we see Bay 10 not as it looks now, but as I believe it looked at the end of the medieval period, about a hundred years before the first surviving antiquarian records of the cloister. Time prevents me from going into detail about some of the interesting dating material in this bay, but there is a predominance of arms of Kentish families, these being the first to the opportunity to make donations, perhaps being at hand when the new plan was devised. The most significant painting shield in Bay 10 is that of Master John Kington, um, a very wealthy cleric who was personally clothed um, as a monk by the Archbishop um, on the sorry, in March 1410, which must have provided the occasion for a significant donation. And this day uh, began to be constructed in June 1410. Although, as with any row of arms, there are random aspects to how the arms are collected, a careful study of every shield in the cloister with close observations of the connections between them reveals that this row of arms is highly structured. It evinces a guiding hand, and without a scintilla of doubt, that guiding hand was Thomas Arundel's. It was not the king, nor by extension could it have been the work of one of the king's heralds. We sit here in a period just before heraldry became carefully regulated by the crown. It was Henry V who first gave his heralds territorial responsibilities and who appointed the first Carter King of Arms. The Archbishop would have been familiar with manuscript rows of arms, which traditionally began with kings and saints, followed by the nobility, and then by knights and squires. Depending on the status of the person for whom the role was compiled, his own family might either proceed or follow that of the kings and saints, or might almost inconsequentially be hidden among the knights and squires. In 
In the cloister, the row of arms is headed outside the door of the chapter house with the Archbishop himself and his immediate family. In the adjacent bay is a very special bay dedicated to the recently deceased King Henry IV, of which more later, which I call the Bay of Christian Kings. <clears throat> Counting down from the Royal Bay, in sequence of construction, we have the Beaumont family bay, the Archbishop's mother having been first married to Lord Beaumont, the Mowbray family bay, the Archbishop's niece having married Sir Thomas Mowbray, the Earl Marshal and Duke of Norfolk, the Levenport family bay, the Esquire John Levenport being a key figure in the royal administration who worked closely with the Archbishop, and finally a Poynings family bay, Lord Poynings being the most prominent of the Archbishop's knights who waited upon him on ceremonial occasions. The second change in direction of the building of the cloister came in January 1413. Until that point, the building was proceeding in a clockwise direction. But following the completion of Bay 25, in November to December 1412, clockwise work was halted and recommenced in an anti-clockwise direction from Bay 34. The evidence for this is that the penultimate bay to be constructed, number 27, includes the arms of Arundel's successor, Henry Chichilly. Arundel died on the 14th of February 1414, just as Bay 27 was being prepared, having left plans for uh, Bay 26. But he was the sole author of the cloister scheme appears to be absolutely confirmed by the fact that the last bay to be constructed uh, was simply a repetition by a reversal of Bay 23, leaving the five central shields for a future donor. And prior Woodensborough otherwise had no idea uh, what to do without Thomas Admiral to guide him. So he had no plan with Bay 26, so I just um, the reason why the direction of was changed for a second time seems obvious. Henry IV lived with his friend the Archbishop for extended periods during 1412 as his health deteriorated, including uh, more than two months of Christchurch Priory. Arundel had to complete the bay that he had designed for the king before he died. It was not to be, but I would like to show you briefly why that play was so special and so affectionately created for King Henry IV. <clears throat> um, it includes all the places visited by um, the King when he was Henry of Bolingbroke in 1392, um, the Holy Land, the Holy Roman Emperor, Bohemia, Hungary, uh, the Island of Rhodes, as represented by the arms of the Knights of Rhodes. It included all his realms and territories, England, Ireland, France, Scotland, Wales, and the Isle of Man. It includes the kingdoms of his brothers-in-law and sons-in-law, Castile and Leon, Navarre, Aragon, Portugal, Sweden, Norway, Pomerania, and Denmark. It includes high points in his life, the visit of the Emperor Manuel Paleologus uh, to England in 1400, and was in the arms of Paleologus there. Uh, his capture of the King of Scotland, the King of Scotland, and the visit of the Grand Master of the Knights of Rhodes in 1409. It includes the three kingly saints, Edward the Confessor, Edmund, and Ethelbert of Kent. We have St. Thomas Beckett, Henry IV was the first monarch um, to uh, have St. Thomas's oil used during the coronation service. We have the arms of St. George, um, carried uh, by Henry um, for his trial by combat uh, with Mowbray in 1398. 
And with some doubling up, we can actually put together nine worthies as well into all this. So Julius Caesar, uh, represented by the double-headed eagle of the Holy Roman Empire, Charlemagne by the arms of France, Godfrey de Guion by the arms of Jerusalem, King Arthur by the three crowns, motif, Judas Maccabeus, perhaps by the griffin, Petra of Troy as a very distinguished, um, sorry, but very distinctive uh, coat of arms, which is a lion in the throne, which we see here. King David by the harp, which also doubles up as Ireland, and I, this is the first usage of the harp to represent the kingdom of Ireland. Uh, Alexander the Great, perhaps, by the hair of Thrace. We're missing one of the um, nine worthies, Joshua, um, but in this place we have um, Prester John, which is perhaps an unusual choice, but it has to be assumed that Henry IV had a peculiar fascination for this historical character. <clears throat> the king is dead. Long live the king. Henry IV died in the Jerusalem chamber at Westminster on the 20th of March, 1413. The archbishop buried the king at Canterbury in June. <clears throat> but less than two weeks after the king's death, he received into the cathedral confraternity the sons of two nobles who had suffered the tainer for their opposition to that monarch. They were John Holland, Earl of Huntingdon, and Thomas Montague, Earl of Salisbury. Their arms were placed together later that year in the Mowbray family bay, bay 30. And here it is, which I also call the Bay of Reconciliation because it includes, it includes the arms of four men who were bitter enemies of Henry IV and who together indicted the Archbishop and his brother Richard Fitzalan, Earl of Arundel, for treason in 1397. <coughs> but this savage act, uh, orchestrated by Richard II, <coughs> um, had resulted in the immediate execution of the Earl and the exile of his brother, the Archbishop. One other member of this group uh, of accusers found a place in the adjacent Bay 29, while another had already been placed in Arundel's own family bay. The Archbishop here was showing considerable magnanimity and giving out a clear signal uh, that he hoped the ushering of a new reign would bring about an end to the internecine strife that had so blighted the reign of Henry IV. The Archbishop's exile in France in 1397 was followed in 1398 by that of Henry Bolingbroke, son of the Duke of Lancaster, who seemed to be Monmouth. The two men forged a strategic alliance in 1399, which brought about the overthrow of Richard II. The extent to which Arundel suffered in that period um, is underscored by a curious uh, shield placed in his personal cloister bay. And here it is, and for a long time, I spent a long time trying to work out which family this could possibly be. And then it struck me that we have here the, the Saltire of St. Andrew, and that uh, Thomas Arundel was translated by Richard II to the Sea of St. Andrews as a means of getting rid of him, which of course was outside English jurisdiction. And so it seems to me that the message here is that the sword and the sea of um, St. Andrews were my personal Calvary. So the sword may be alluding to the death of his brother or to the revolution, um, or both. Um, someone whom Arundel could never forgive was the king's own father, John of Gaunt, who had treated Richard Fitzalan badly in his capacity as steward of England in 1397, and then had sentenced the earl to death. The absence of, the, of his arms from the cloister is striking, given that the king was a generous benefactor. There are two instances where his arms are called for, donations having been made uh, by the king's full sister, Elizabeth of Lancaster, married to John Holland, and the king's half-sister, Catherine of Lancaster, married to the king of Castile and Leon. In both instances, their paternal arms were vetoed. 
to be replaced by the new royal arms adopted by Henry IV in around 1403. This would seem to be a clear example of Gamnatio Memoriae. Courts apparent deletion further confirms the fact that the cloister was in no sense a royal project. Nowhere do we find the arms of Henry IV's beloved wife, Mary de Boone, the mother of his six children. Nowhere do we find explicit reference to the king's sister, Philippa, Queen of Portugal, nor do we have his daughter Blanche married in 1402 to Louis, Duke of Bavaria, who took with her that magnificent royal crown now housed in Munich. Called aside, the Archbishop permitted some surprising individuals <coughs> to have their arms included um, in the scheme, most notably um, Sir John Oldcastle, whom he well knew to be a dangerous religious radical. He is here along with five other suspected or known Lollards. It was not until after Arundel's death uh, that Oldcastle paid the ultimate price for his heresy and his anarchist views in being burnt alive. It must be wondered what game of cat and mouse was being played making these donations. These proto-Protestants who sought the abolition of the monasteries were unlikely to have looked for the intercession of the monks to reduce the time spent in purgatory. The final tally of the cloister donors further supports the direct personal involvement of Thomas Arundel. Um, the total, the complete tally of shields and other devices is 856, of which 576 were unique. Now, this comprised 365 families, of whom 51 were peerage families, and 21 principalities, 12 religious houses, 9 bishops, 7 saints, 3 heroes, four cities or towns, two priests, one monk, and God um, in the form of the Holy Trinity. Um, interesting to note that, that, that God's arms are quite similar to those of the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, which I suppose is pity. Now altogether, 33% of the shield of the um, donors can be linked directly to the Archbishop himself. Of course, my contention is that he actually met all of them, or probably all of them personally, but certainly we can say that he met a third of them without a shadow of a doubt. 14% were directly linked to Henry IV, um, almost half to the Duchy of Lancaster, which should not surprise us given the fact that, um, that Thomas Arundel was Chancellor for quite a long period of time during the Rain. The careful breakdown um, of the shields by county shows that every county is represented, um, but those that are most overrepresented are those where the Archbishop habitually resided um, Kent, um, London, Sussex. But for instance, 22% were linked to Kent. Now, this shouldn't be totally surprising, there are obviously proximity factors here. Um, but my contention is that um, Thomas Arundel collected the donors in a book which travelled with him, uh, that these were not people just banging on the door of Canterbury Cathedral. Um, most of the counties uh, that um, had a strong Duchy of Lancaster presence tend to be overrepresented, which is not surprising given the, the Lancastrian um, emphasis. I must conclude by explaining why it's taken a hundred years to arrive at this new analysis. Apart from the obvious issue of the necessary scale of the project with so many shields to consider, what has deterred others has been the incomplete and highly contradictory nature of the antiquarian sources. Yet these sources are crucially important given that many of the carved shields or of a generic type, such as a single line rampant, simple cross, 
flowers and fesses, which are quite meaningless without knowledge of their original colour. <coughs> Medieval paint on stonework was quite ephemeral and needed periodic restoration. It's evident that repainting was taking place even in the Tudor era, and that erroneous repainting took place. The first antiquarian whose records have survived, Richard Scarlett, made a perambulation in 1599, but noted colours for only 13 shields. Thomas Philpott, visiting on the 2nd of March 1613, recorded colours for seven shields out of the 690 that he sketched. The course that he took that day is problematic in that it's been the cause of much <coughs> subsequent confusion. Um, his manuscript was copied by an unknown scholar who recorded additional colours, probably within a few decades, but Philpott's erratic course quite likely caused the colours to be added in the wrong places in some instances. <coughs> and this wasn't the end of the confusion that Philpott caused. Um, about the same time as still got an unknown antiquarian recorded 683 and it assigned colour to 79 shields. The manuscript now resides in the library here. And taken into consideration with other sources provides evidence of erroneous repainting of coaster shields in both the 16th and the 17th centuries. So the top um, two shields recorded around 1600 um, are very, very distinctive and identifiable shields that are clearly in the wrong colours. And this is why they were noted, because the, uh, the, the unknown antiquary was thought these were rather curious and wanted to work out what they are. Now here we have the arms of Hawkston as they should have been, but already by 1600 they have been painted like this, and by Worms Day they have been painted in as this, so this is evidence of two good paintings, but here we have the arms as they should be in uh, an upper triforium window in the nave, which survived the Puritan assault in 1642. During the reign of Charles I in the time of King Bargrave, um, it's quite certain that another repainting was sponsored in the 1620s or 30s by the notorious antiquarian forger, Sir Edward Deary, in whose library I believe the Society of Antiquaries manuscript probably once resided. We can see that he appropriated some of the shields for the, bow, the two bows known um, for shields of Deary. And these, this is what they would have been originally. The manuscript came to light a few years ago in the hand of Brian Fawcett, the father of English archaeology. It's now in the possession of the Kentish historian Duncan Harrington FSA, who I'm pleased to see us here today, and who kindly furnished me with a copy. It must belong to the 1750s when Fawcett collected extensive church notes in Kent. He drew 583 <laughs> shields and ascribed colouring to none of them. Um, but he did attempt to provide family names, which makes it possible to determine what colours he might have seen and what could definitely not have been there. Uh, I believe that he did not ascribe colour in part because he distrusted the accuracy of restorations which he knew had taken place in the previous century. Uh, soon afterwards, the cloister being in a dilapidated condition, a decision was taken to whitewash the vault. Despite the son's willament, uh, it was still able to discern considerable traces of colour in the 1820s. His heraldic notices of Canterbury Cathedral, published in 1827, was denounced by the contemporary Kentish historian and heraldist, the Reverend Thomas Streetfield, FSA, who said, Mr. Willman's knowledge will not justify his confident appropriation of tinctures which divest his work of all authority. One of the things that uh, Streetfield took particular exception to were these arms of proud, and this is as they appear today. Um, but all 
the three antiquarian sources all recorded that they have fishes in their mouths. Now, this is what um, Willamette recorded in his book, but clearly this wasn't uh, present. Now, what Willamette failed to explain was how he arrived at his uh, descriptions of shields. He completely omitted to mention that he was using the antiquarian sources in order to do a kind of a reconstruction. Um, and this um, has caused real problems, or even more problems than, than Phil Potts has caused. Now, the problem was that he incorporated contradictory observations, applying many of them to the wrong shields in the wrong bays. And it took me many years to understand exactly what he'd done and how I might still <coughs> use him as a source. And in the end, I realized that only observations which were uniquely his might have any value. And even then, uh, he had a tendency uh, to ascribe colours because he believed he, he had identified the family in question. And this is a really rather good example uh, because he decided that these were the arms of Chamberlain. Um, but this cannot possibly have been the case because the Chamberlains were descended from the Chamberlains of Scotland. But in the 16th century, they, they decided they were actually descended from the Chamberlains of Normandy. And at, at that point, they adopted these arms, which were not in use at the time when the cloister was constructed. And in fact, the only possibility is that these are the arms of Darcy of Durham, who brought similar arms, but in completely um, different colours. Um, so even um, when um, Willamette's arms were uniquely recorded, there was a possibility that uh, they might have belonged to a false uh, restoration. So one of the important realizations was in extremis, it was okay to ignore Willamette. Now happily there are many associations and groupings of arms in the cloister which provide an additional tool for identification. One not used by previous scholars, it's been possible to reject some of the recorded colours with high confidence. By 1914, all original traces of colour were gone. According to Ralph Griffin, they were scraped away in the restoration which took place in 1835. This brings us to the 1930s and 40s when the bow decision was taken to repaint. Uh, the restorers among them command the messenger who produced a convenient um, picture book in 1947 to document the completion of the project, essentially adopted the best guess approach to assigning colours to many of the arms. Um, and as a consequence, 95 families um, have been added to the project who have no right to be there at all, which is more than a quarter of the total. Now, to be fair, um, Ralph Griffin defended Willemont against the Reverend Street Field, um, and what um, Messenger did was he uncritically accepted a lot of Willemont's false attributions without um, questioning whether they could be correct or not. This is, this is one of them, um, and this a very small amount of research would reveal that this Portrait, this marriage could not have ever taken place. Uh, but actually finding out which family it was was a much longer job. And um, this required many weeks of work to actually not just find the family that it might have been to make sure, but to make sure that no other potential families could have had such a marriage. So I can well see why um, in the 1930s there was a great reluctance to take on this um, I probably failed to the burden of responsibility of getting it right if the cathedral ever decided to restore the restoration and I was asked to advise. Perhaps things should be left forever as they are. It will never be possible to completely certain about the exact original composition, but I believe that mine comes in reasonable proximity to it. And I will leave you with just a few of the many previously unknown arms of which I hazarded an identification. First, uh, the arms which I believe are those of Thomas Chillenden. 
And happily, these arms are not only present in the cloister, but they're also uh, at the top of the steps leading down to the martyrdom within the cathedral, along with three other shields. One of these shields is the arms of the priory, another the arms of Leeds Priory, and the fourth are the arms of John de Shelbridge, who was made of Canterbury in 1489. Now, the arms of um, Leeds Priory offer an important clue here, because Chillenden, from, from whence Thomas Chillenden came, belonged to Leeds Priory. Um, the presence of their arms in such a place is otherwise largely inexplicable. The second clue comes from these things here, which have been interpreted as letters M, uh, but I think can also stand for mitres, and the priors of Canterbury were, were mitred priors um, with papal um, permission. Uh, the colours are completely speculative, but it seems sensible to improve the Benedictine colour of black. Um, secondly, the arms which I believe are those of the prominent Canterbury family of stable gates. Now, why else would someone adopt a horse harness on their, um, on their arms? Um, there, there's no family of horse harness or hames, as you might also call it. I've seen plenty of westerns, and the thing that you have outside a stable uh, most commonly is a horse harness. But what the stable family um, took its name from the Archbishop's Liberty um, beside the priory, which once housed the stables um, of the diocese. But the giveaway here is in this version of the arms, we have those three Greek letters and Kai, Ieta, Kai for Jesus Christ Canterbury. Um, the Priory of Christ Church was referred to as the Prior of Jesus Christ of Canterbury. So, hence, I suspect. And finally, um, this particular shield, these have been described as merchant marks, but really they're pretty obviously masons marks. We have the masons square here. In fact, a Freemason today might be quite pleased with arms such as these, but we also have a church, uh, very clearly perhaps, a cathedral um, flying a banner, and these would seem to me to be perfect arms that have been adopted by the cathedral architect, Stephen Lote, who replaced Henry Eagerly as the cathedral architect in 1400, and who oversaw the building of the cloister. Now, my 800-page account of the cloister, which is illustrated, recounts the diverse Canterbury tales that, put together, make up the lost tale of the cloister itself. I hope you will come to agree with me that this monument has much more to offer than the glory of its design and execution. Against all expectation, it can offer some unusual insights into English society in an era of civil war. Thank you.